Uh, hey, yeah. hey, good morning, good afternoon. Let me do a part two of this. Y'all, when you go back and look at that hearing, and this is good morning, y'all already know, good afternoon. Y'all already know I'm back talking about this um, hearing. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, and I want y'all to listen to it real good. How Elijah Cummins, the dude Mark Meadows, when he was trying to defend his whiteness, how he, excuse me, how he, um, he said, I defended you when some, and I'm like, and then the guy kept cutting him off. And I'm like, what did you defend him about? Do y'all got some kind of agreement, sick kind of agreement with each other that you've covered his dirt and he's covered yours? Um, I'm still a little disturbed by that little bitty um, spot right there because I don't know what he meant. But um, what I wanted y'all to do is take a listen to was uh, Robin D'Angelo. And she describes Mark Meadows, is that his name, so profoundly to me. Um, that I want y'all to just take a listen to this clip and hopefully I can share it with you guys and y'all can get just as much out of it as I did. Okay? All right. White fragility is what we saw from that guy when he became the victim and uh, Talib in, ended up uh, apologizing to him. And because he had turned himself into the victim that fast. So let me just that gas, that projection. Just listen. To you guys. And this is Robin. Thank you so much. OK, that was such a rush. <laughs> um, uh, before I uh, launch in, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to read a little bit, riff a little bit, kind of guide you along with some slides. But but I do want to reiterate that this is ta this talk is happening on the ancestral territories of indigenous peoples. And I believe very, very deeply that if we don't know our history, if we cannot trace the past into the present, uh, we cannot explain current conditions in ways that are transformative rather than, than victim blaming. And I think uh, today it's very, very clear when we see uh, struggles around water rights at Standing Rock, uh, the Duwamish yet again denied federal recognition, uh, which denies uh, treaty rights and sovereignty. These, these struggles are never separated from the present. Uh, at the same time, a piece of white fragility is that white people are not taught their history. We don't know our history. So I want to acknowledge that. I want to position myself, of course, as a white person. Uh, and I'm talking to a very, uh, talking and addressing a very, very specific dynamic. This is arguably the most complex, uh, nuanced social Sorry, dilemma since the beginning of this country. Uh, and there are myriad roads in, and all of them are essential, but so consistently left off the table is uh, whiteness, right? So we often learn about this group and that group and their struggles and their triumphs and their heroes and heroines, and yet we don't ask ourselves struggles and triumphs in relation to whom, right? Uh, and so, again, I'm going to focus on, on uh, white folks and white people. Uh, I do use humor. And I want to say a little bit about why I use humor. Some of it is my style. Uh, and also because uh, there's so much tension and so much anxiety and so much charge uh, and so much defensiveness and on and on uh, for white people around race that we can, when we begin to get challenged, we can shut down really quickly or glaze over or tune out. Uh, and all of those, of course, function to protect our positions and hold our worldviews in place. And so the laughter can help release some of that. Uh, if we can laugh at this uh, and mock it a little bit to be, to be direct, um, it, it can help us then step back and not take ourselves so seriously and hopefully again open it up. And I want to say that this is killing uh, people of color. 
right? This is very, very serious. So my humor is not meant to trivialize that, but it is a strategy, a one of many that I use uh, in order to try to, to air this out and open it up. So I want to start uh, by reading a bit from the beginning. White people in North America live in a society that is deeply separate and unequal by race, and white people are the beneficiaries of that separation and inequality. As a result, we are insulated from racial stress at the same time that we come to feel entitled to and deserving of our advantage. Given how seldom we experience racial discomfort in a society we dominate, we haven't had to build our racial stamina. Socialized into a deeply internalized sense of superiority that we either are unaware of or can never admit to ourselves, we become highly fragile in conversations about race. We consider a challenge to our racial worldviews as a challenge to our very identities as good moral people. Thus, we perceive any attempt to connect us to the system of racism as an unsettling and unfair moral offense. The smallest amount of racial stress is intolerable. The mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a range of defensive responses. And these include emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and withdrawal from the stress-inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white equilibrium. Oops. Oh, y'all, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, shit. To our very identities as good moral people. Thus, we perceive any attempt to connect us to the system of racism as an unsettling and unfair moral offense. The smallest amount of racial stress is intolerable. The mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a range of defensive responses. And these include emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and withdrawal from the stress-inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white equilibrium as they repel the challenge, return our racial comfort, and maintain our dominance within the racial hierarchy. I conceptualize this process as white fragility. Though white fragility is triggered by discomfort and anxiety, it is born of superiority and entitlement. White fragility is not weakness per se. In fact, it is a powerful means of white racial control and the protection of white advantage. In my early days uh, of work of what was then termed a diversity trainer, I was taken aback by how angry and defensive so many white people became at the suggestion that they were connected to racism in any way. The very idea that they would be required to attend a workshop on racism outraged them. They entered the room angry and made that feeling clear to us throughout the day as they slammed their notebooks down on the table, refused to participate in exercises, and argued against any and all points. I couldn't understand their resentment or disinterest in learning more about such a complex social dynamic as racism. These reactions were especially perplexing when there were few or no people of color in their workplace and they had the opportunity to learn from my co-facilitators of color. I assumed that in these circumstances, an educational workshop on racism would be appreciated. After all, didn't the lack of diversity indicate a problem or at least suggest that some perspectives were missing? or that the participants might be undereducated about race because of scant cross-racial interactions? It took me several years to see beneath these reactions. Um, at first I was intimidated by them and they held me back and kept me careful and quiet, but over time I began to see what lay beneath this anger and resistance to discuss race or listen to people of color. I observed consistent responses from a variety of participants. For example, many white participants who lived in white suburban neighborhoods and had no sustained relationships with people of color were absolutely certain that they held no racial prejudice or animosity. Other participants simplistic, simplistically reduced racism to a matter of nice people versus mean people. Most appeared to believe that racism ended in 1865 with the end of uh, enslavement. There was both knee-jerk defensiveness about any suggestion that being white had meaning and a refusal to acknowledge any advantage to being white. 
And over time, I began to see what I think of as the pillars of whiteness, the unexamined beliefs that prop up our racial responses. I could see the power of the belief that only bad people were racist, as well as how individualism allowed white people to exempt themselves from the forces of socialization. Wow. I could see how we are taught to think about racism only as discrete acts committed by individual people rather than as a complex interconnected system and in light of so many white expressions of resentment toward people of color i realized that we see ourselves as entitled to and deserving of more than people of color deserve i saw our investment in a system that serves us i also saw how hard we worked to deny all this and how defensive we became when these dynamics were named in turn i saw how our defensiveness maintained the racial status quo And none of the white people that I identify, whose actions I describe in this book, would identify as racist. Uh, In fact, I think they would most likely identify as racially progressive and vehemently deny any complicity with racism. Yet all of their responses illustrate white fragility and how it holds racism in place. These responses spur the daily frustrations and uh, indignities people of color endure from white people who see themselves as open-minded and thus not racist. This book is intended for us, for white progressives who so often, despite our conscious intentions, make life so difficult for people of color. I believe that white progressives cause the most daily damage to people of color. And I define a white progressive as any white person who thinks he or she is not racist or is less racist or is in the choir or already gets it. White progressives can be the most difficult for people of color because to the degree that we think we we have it, we're going to put all of our energy into making sure you think that we have it and none of it into what we need to be doing for the rest of our lives. Right? <coughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. White progressives do indeed uphold and perpetrate racism, but our defensiveness and certitude make it virtually impossible to explain to us how we do so. So um, I'm pretty sure I'm speaking to a room filled with white progressives. So let me just be clear, you are not the choir. Uh, There is no choir. I am not the choir. Uh, the, when I say there is no choir, it's because my, my learning will never be finished. And this moment I think I'm the choir, I think I, I'm going to be done and I'm going to have certitude. Uh, I often um, joke, but at some, some levels it, it, it's kind of true. When I first applied to be that diversity trainer back in the early 90s, I, I thought, well, of course I'm qualified to lead uh, discussions on racism. I'm a vegetarian. Um, how could I be racist? Now, I would need to be vegan today. Um, but, you know, in the You can hear a little I fake pretty, laugh because they're nervous. Right? Nervous I laughter. I called a communist once when I said, no, I'm a vegetarian. Um, but, you know, my point is, I, I just thought it was all about open mindedness and alternativeness. And, and, and let me just say that, you know, I love Seattle and everything I learned about white fragility, I learned here working with white progressives. So, chapter one challenges to talking to white people about racism. All right? <laughs> I have never met a white person who did not have an opinion on racism, have you? If you are not sure that all white people have opinions on racism, just bring it up the next time you're around a bunch of white people. Maybe tonight when you have a drink in Ballard after the talk. And see how that goes. Not only do we all have opinions, but they tend to be very emotionally charged, and that has nothing to do with whether they're informed or not. I have an opinion on virtually everything that does not make them informed. I I don't believe you can grow up or spend any significant time in the United States without developing opinions on racism, and they will be emotional and strongly held. And again, that has nothing to do with whether they're informed. 
Uh, and in fact, if you are white and you have not devoted years of sustained study, struggle, and focus on this topic, your opinions are necessarily very limited. And no, a trip to Costa Rica, multiracial nieces and nephews, <laughs> right? Mark uh, Meadows. These are not sustained study, struggle, and focus. Now, now, how can I say that when I don't know most of the people in this room? Uh, and this, of course, is the first thing that tends to trigger white fragility, generalizing about white people. Um, as a sociologist, I'm really comfortable generalizing about white people. Um, social life is predictable and patterned, you know, in, in really observable ways, and we've got to grapple with those patterns. But I can say this, that, that your opinions without sustained study struggle focus, or, you know, mistake-making, relationship building, repair, uh, they're superficial because nothing, nothing in society gives you the information you need to have more than that. In fact, you can get through graduate school in this country without ever discussing racism, can you not? You can get through teacher education in this country without discussing racism. And if, you have a, if you're in a progressive teacher education program, you'll have one required multicultural education class. Uh, but that doesn't mean you'll be talking about racism. You might just be talking about how to introduce ethnic authors in February. Right? You can get through law school. You can get so, through social work. Right? You can be seen as qualified to lead a major or minor institution in this country, to lead a group of people, to supervise people. You can be seen as qualified to do those things with virtually no ability whatsoever to engage with any complexity or nuance in the issue of racism. Wow. Think about it, Joe. All right. Uh, so that is the first challenge, humility. The second is individualism. I, I, I apparently white people do not understand socialization um, because we really think that we are exempt from it. Uh, and of course, the irony of that is because we're socialized to value uh, the individual. Uh, we put a lot of effort there, but we think that you know just because I say I am or want to be, I could be exempt from these forces. Uh, so, so that is another challenge. Um, and again, generalizing, suggesting uh, race has meaning for white people will often trigger white fragility. <laughs> we think if we don't see it, it isn't there, and you haven't explained it to me yet enough so that I understand it, so I'm not really sure that could be valid. Okay. And we tend to use our reactions as a way out. There is no way we're going to get where we need to go from a place of white comfort. And I am comfortable uh, racially virtually 24-7. Uh, so that is not my goal, but we will often use that lack of comfort as a sign that something's been done wrong rather than something probably has been done right. And that we need to use that as a way in to the deeper framework that would cause such upset uh, rather than use it as a way out. And we don't understand racism as a system. So, so this is another key challenge, which leads me uh, to chapter two, which is racism and white supremacy. Um, racism is a system, not an event. And it's the system we're in. And none of us could be, and none of us were exempt from its forces. But the way we're taught to think of racism functions beautifully to not only obscure the system, but to exempt us from its forces, right? or to have us uh, believe we are exempted from its forces. Now, as a white person, I was raised to be racially illiterate. And I, I actually think all white people are raised to be racially illiterate um, in this culture. And in gaining racial literacy, uh, I have had to understand not just the collective dynamics and dimensions of racism, mm. but how racism inter, uh, impacts different groups who are perceived and defined as people of color, how it uh, impacts them differently. Oh. Right? So 